Welcome everyone to That Gaming Show. Um, things might look a little different this week. Uh, unfortunately, Jackson can't be with us and Milky's not feeling the best. Uh, so we've invited our friend uh, Junglist to come along and join us tonight. So How are you? Good to be here. Yeah. So a uh, bit of a different setup, but all the same coverage you'd expect uh, with all the things happening in the wonderful world of gaming. Um, so we'll launch straight into it. And one of the first cabs off the rank um, is something that, that we've um, kind of popped up recently. It's, it's been an ongoing thing for, for a while, um, but has had a bit of attention brought to it recently with, um, the, with gambling and the being linked to video games and the video game industry using techniques similar to, to what we see with the casino industry uh, to attract and um, retain dollars within games. So, yeah. And Jung, we were talking about it off camera before and it's something that you're quite passionate about and something that you've spent it a is. lot of time looking into. Mm. Um, the, the report that came out recently was from um, Joshua Crook, who's a PhD candidate from the University of Adelaide, um, just highlighting a few different things. But it, it is something that you've been looking at for a while. Um, yeah, I'm glad he wrote the article. I mean, the uh, it, it appeared in the conversation, I think it was reposted in the ABC, um, and it didn't really have much new in the article. It was kind of a 101 of what the games industry is up to on the gambling front. Um, but I'm really glad that it was written because I, I think more gaming writers should be talking about this thing. Um, I think it's it's probably the biggest social issue that faces our industry. Um, yeah, wow. And uh, I think more games writers and people in the games media need to be at least showing an interest and knowing the techniques that developers use. Because in development circles, this is common knowledge. You can go to your local IGDA event and the, even the young developers know this stuff. Yeah. Um, first and second year of your school at AIE, they, they know how to do this stuff. Um, yeah, well, some of the things that um, Josh mentioned in his article, uh, techniques that developers use, and spe specifically free-to-play titles, and you'll see an example behind us here, um, where you use uh, things like poker chips, cards, or gems, you know, some kind of in-game item um, that uses real-world dollars for in-game content like, uh, you know, visual enhancements, um, you know, digital trophies, virtual goods, so things like, you know, skins for your character, you know, speed up um, buildings in, you know, kind of strategy games and that kind of thing. Um, and Another technique is progress gate. So a progress gate is, you know, where gameplay is delayed or slowed, um, you know, for a period of time, and you can pay to have it sped up and rejoin the game. So there are a couple yeah. of techniques that he specifically mentions in his article. Yeah, uh, there okay. are a lot of nasty tricks that developers can use that um, psychologically, you know, they're all designed to get you to either play more or pay more. Yeah. And obviously the article cites mobile games as uh, a big... Um, uh, sort of, uh, it kind of mainly talks about mobile games. They, they, of course, were not the first to do this. Yeah. Uh, you know, people have been experiencing this kind of gameplay for a long time. I don't know if you've played World of Warcraft and the other MMOs and stuff like that. Um, it's You can't equate it directly to a pokey machine because you're not spending money, but you are spending time. Yeah. And when a game is uh, is using these techniques to prey on people that have that thing in their brain that make them a little bit more susceptible to addiction, it becomes predatory and it becomes destructive. So even if even though you're not spending money directly, you're just spending time, it can be a destructive thing. And of course, these games aren't regulated. Kids can play them and, yeah. and that sort of thing. So that's the sort of thing, that's that's the area where I have a problem. And uh, yeah, the, the list of psychological tricks that they use you know, we could talk all night about them. Yeah. Um, that's one, you know, psychologically, uh, we're more likely to respond and, and act if we're going to lose something as yeah. opposed to if we're going to gain something. So, you know, if you give someone something and then threaten to take it away. So, uh, you know, you had to, I think in Farmville, once upon a time, they would, they would give you your crops, but they would uh, die if you wouldn't log in a certain amount of times yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, there's the overall design of loot-based games, uh, where it's, they give you a whole bunch of rewards towards the start, and then they steadily spread them out over the course of time because it is quite literally a Skinner box. You know, they've, they've done these tests. Uh, you will keep on pressing that lever to, uh, to get your, your pill, um, and you'll press that lever at a, a more sort of a slower rate over time. You'll press it more and more, and you'll get used to the pill not coming, but you'll, you'll keep doing it. Yeah. So we psychologically, in cage. <laughs> absolutely, and yeah. you know, people, do all these things to justify the behavior to themselves. They say, oh, the real game starts at end game. It's absolute nonsense. The real game starts when you press start. 
It's just that you're more invested when you hit end game. So yeah. uh, I think it's a hard thing for some people to hear, but yeah. um, there it, 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 And it is, because it, I mean, you know, as someone in the industry always championed against, um, you know, those kind of um, uh, alignments, you know, have, very much, I have never seen, it is kind of the, the great social um, problem that, that, that you've mentioned here, um, you know, because I, I've seen, you know, obviously gambling and poker machines are, the, I think, the biggest social scourge that we see in this country by far. Um, and it was interesting to see, you know, this um, the PhD candidate talk about these things and kind of link them. It was, wasn't until I realized, like, okay, like, I can understand where this is coming from. Mm. Um, so, you know, if you had to kind of categorize them, because I, I actually play a lot of mobile games. Um, mm. I feel it's kind of an untapped category when it comes to... to Gaming, and I feel it's one that because it, it's so vast, is you know. So I spend a little bit of time in there, kind of playing various things. So I'm very familiar with the the strategies that they use sure. to kind of procure more physical dollars out of me. Mm. But it was interesting that you said like the time is actually because it. And when you say that, are you referring more to kind of your MMO category? Yeah, I mean their their sort of agenda is to get you to play longer so they yeah. can get your monthly subscription. Yeah, uh, most of them. Obviously, there's some like Guild Wars. That you know, that you just buy the game and you get it forever. Yeah. Um, and I actually, you know, surprise, surprise, found Guild Wars Two to be a lot more fun than the other MMOs because yeah. they didn't do these things where it's like you have to go to a mailbox to check your mail or you have to go to a specific person in a city just to do uh, a PvP. You know, it's because yeah. they don't have any agenda in wasting your time. You can just do the things you want. It's it's just fun. Yeah. Their only thing is making the game fun enough for you to tell your friends that it's fun, so they should buy it as well. Yeah. See, it's interesting you say that because as someone who doesn't spend a lot of time playing um, like one game and kind of break it up into to various titles, um, mm. but I've always been daunted by the MMO. Mm. Uh, I played, um, you know, the Star Wars one. I started with uh, Elder Scrolls. Um, I did play Warcraft once upon a time. Um, but the time commitment for me was just far, far too great and yeah. far too much of a commitment. And it's interesting you say, you know, that's kind of their hook, so they get the the fee. But if, as a as a user who doesn't have that level of uh, that amount of time to invest in it, yeah, um, I would actually be more more inclined to like, look, if you just give me something where I play a couple <laughs> of hours, uh, you know, a week or or a, a month, yeah. and I can actually ha enjoy the game in its because when you're grinding at those levels, and um, you know, I remember playing Star Wars and just like, you know, you didn't get your lightsaber until level ten, so that was really annoying because I'm like the mm. only reason I'm playing this is to get a goddamn yeah. lightsaber so it so, probably took you several evenings just to get to yeah that. right so and then it cut off and it was no longer free play after 10 so mm. um, and they eventually changed that but it was it was like look I, I will play the game but like if you make, make it too hard I'm not going to subscribe any longer yeah and that's the thing like this this sort of stuff and the article mentions the the term whales which is a gambling term for you know that yeah. there there are people in society who have brains that are more susceptible to this type of thing. Yeah. And the whale is, is a reference to someone who can be preyed upon and will typically spend a lot more money on a game or a pokey machine or something yeah. like that. So yeah, for a lot of people, they don't have this problem. They can look at a game like that and say, that's too much of a time investment. It's not actually that fun. Yeah. I'm gonna say no, but uh, it becomes a problem with those people who are more susceptible to it. And you know, I don't have anything against like people like, there are different kinds of fun. I don't have anything against people who just want to come home, de-stress, turn their brain off, do, you know, an intelligent rotation of abilities for a few hours, and then go to bed. That's totally fine. Um, I just have a problem when it's being used to, to prey upon people who are susceptible, when it becomes destructive, uh, when it happens to kids, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. I think we need to pay more attention to the techniques that are being used. Like, there are... There are warning labels on games for certain things yeah. like gore and stuff like yeah. that. I'm actually a lot more interested in, in what gameplay. type of fun there yeah. is because there are different types of fun. There's like we have these, these compulsions in us as human beings which have been there since cave person days. Yeah. And you know they, they sort of feed what we want to do. Like we yeah. like hearing stories. And you know it's theorized that we like hearing stories because way back in cave person days, someone was telling a story about a poisonous berry and the person who listened knew not to eat it. And the person who didn't would, would eat it and die. Evolutionarily, we have an these- An NPC would tell you not to eat the- uh, Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> but evolution has sort of bred this stuff in us. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's kind of taking advantage of that, but there's, there's satisfying those compulsions 
and there's manipulating those compulsions. Yeah. That's the big distinction that I make. So a game like, yeah. you know, you have games that do satisfy those compulsions, like things with like communication, teamwork, hand-eye coordination, uh, stuff like that, solving puzzles, those are all real types of fun. Uh, but this, this Skinner box stuff and the Pavlovian stuff where we're just uh, associating chimes in our head with reward, um, that's compulsion manipulation. And yeah. that's, that's the type of thing where I, I think there should be a kind of a warning label. Like when I buy a game, I want to know, is this just going to play tricks on my mind? Is this going to make my mind think it's having fun? And yeah. then at the end of four hours, I think that actually wasn't any fun. Yeah. Well, no, exactly right. So um, we did have a question come in from Facebook um, from Tim. Um, and he was asking about old school games. Mm. And um, it, was, it was something that we've discussed on this show um, in the past and how arcade games were actually made to be really difficult mm. so that you would die and then you would put in more 20-cent mm. pieces. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, the, the old classic arcade games, you know, like Street Fighter and, you know, et cetera, um, not yeah, Buck Hunter, as <laughs> Tim points to here. Um, We've uh, learned a lot since then. Yeah, so the strategies evolved from, you know, putting in 20 cent pieces to the home environment where it's like, now how do you get those 20 cent pieces? Yeah, and that's, you know, now it's nowadays it's make it as easy as possible at the start, reward the player as much as possible at the start, and then have that curve go up, and then when they die, you can pay to play more. Yeah. But uh, no, that's absolutely a good point, and like all this stuff, like even the, the Skinner box stuff, like it probably wasn't the intention in the early days of D&D, &D, but that's where it all comes from. Yeah. You know, that sort of numerical progression system. Yeah. Well, it was interesting that um, this article came out um, when it did because uh, there was a piece of news uh, back in August uh, about an Australian poker machine manufacturer, Aristocrat, actually bought an online gaming, um, a social gaming company called uh, Plarium. Please forgive me if I'm mis mispronouncing that. Fact check in the <laughs> comments. Um, which creates the game uh, Viking War of Clans, which you're seeing behind us. Um, so it's interesting that someone who specializes yeah. in poker machine manufacturing is now moving into this into this space. That's not the only way that the gambling companies are moving into this space as well, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, I've just finished doing a big story for Game Informer uh, in which I look at the job market for Australian developers. Um, and uh, we sort of divide it up by disciplines, so between programmers and artists and designers and, and stuff like that. The numbers, uh, the, the available jobs for someone who's graduating uh, in those fields, uh, a very, very large percentage of those jobs are from gambling companies. Yeah, right. And you see them target the graduates as well. So, you know, they might, it, they might see the ad for a company like you know Quantum or AIE, and they they've got these three D rendered dragons, and you know make games for a living. That's the sort of dream that they're selling. Mm. And then when you graduate, over fifty percent of um, jobs that are available for you are with, uh, the orig with, with gambling. The world, yeah. yeah, and you know the the rest of the jobs in the gaming industry are very competitive. Yeah. So it's it's a different sort of thing than they thought that they would be getting into. Um, I highly recommend anyone read uh, the next Game Informer AU. There's a, a lot of cool stats that we've got around that stuff. Yeah. And this is why we need support from, um, you know, Senator Ludlam was a great advocate of the games industry, games development industry in Australia. Um, and it's something that we really need to see, again, is that level of support from the government. So there are real gaming jobs for real games that do yeah. good social good uh, in, our, in our industry here well, in Australia. That's why 51 percent of Australian developers are in Melbourne, because they're supporting it. Yeah. yeah. Good on you, Melbourne. Yeah. They've got it right. <laughs> All right. This week, there's been a lot of talk about Nintendo. Uh, Nintendo had uh, their announcements, uh, which you can hear, which you can see streaming behind us. Um, talking about a whole range of different things. Um, you know, Super Mario Odyssey featured heavily within the announcement. And um, the details that came out of it weren't quite what everyone expected to be talking about uh, this late in the week. Because uh, Mario went topless for right. the first time. Uh, so it seems... I didn't watch the announcement. I woke up to an absolute Twitter storm uh, yeah. about nipples, and I wasn't quite sure why. Uh, and I soon found out. So it's funny what people pay attention. I looked at the image, and I didn't even notice. And then it wasn't where my mind was at. No, it wasn't. And then I looked at the text accompanying the tweet, and it's like Mario's topless for the first time ever. And I'm like, oh yeah, he is topless. And then another tweet said his nipples are showing, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah. I guess they are. Well, you know, he's a <laughs> yeah. human plumber. Uh, humans do have nipples. Um, he's flashing some spicy pepperonis. Yeah. Well, there was, uh, you know, the, the memes have been endless. We've seen them pretty much nonstop since uh, since the news came out. But um, I did see. <laughs> Apparently, he's been 
um, sleeveless before, and in an ad in 2004, he had a tribal tattoo on his on his shoulder. A, um, a tribal tattoo. A tribal tattoo. Wow. And I, I will pull it up. Uh, Google Mario's tribal tattoo, and you can you can see for yourself. This is great. We're gonna like bring up all the old photos of Mario where he has embarrassing haircuts and he had like right? frosted tips in the 90s hey, well, and why, stuff like why that. I think he wears the hat all the time, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, yeah, so, but it, it didn't appear when he, um, when he took the shirt off for his beach stroll, so, um. Oh, so he got one of those tattoo removal services. Yeah. The Mario is ashamed of his tribal tattoo. Mushroom Kingdom has, has good tattoo removal. It's, yeah, they're hear, the best, I best, hear. best in the kingdom. But not that hard. I've, you know. But. No. Um, but it was an interesting announcement. There were quite a few, um, bits and pieces in there that you thought were quite interesting and a lot of games that you were excited about. Yeah, um. A lot of games, I'm, I'm especially like if I were to just start at the top, uh, my most interested stuff would be the Nindies. Um, absolutely. Uh, I've been, uh, anyone who watched Five Inch Floppy on Telstra knows I absolutely loved Super Meat Boy. Um, I think I even called it perfect. Uh, such a good platformer. Uh, so Super Meat Boy Forever is going to be coming uh, on uh, 2018, I think it is. That's going to be kind of an endless runner version of Super Meat Boy. Uh, if anyone doesn't know Super Meat Boy, it's like a a platformer that is very hard but very fair. Um, you have uh, uh, lots of wall jumps in it and stuff like that. You can kind of slide up walls. The, the main character is made of meat and you are rescuing Bandage Girl. And uh, yeah, it had a lot of levels that were just really hard and they played with physics a lot. It was, it was a fantastic platformer. Uh, but this one's gonna be sort of the endless runner version of that concept. Uh, but it's a little bit different. It's a, probably a bit similar to, looked a bit similar to me uh, to that Super Mario run. Right. Uh, in that you can go back the other way a little bit if you do a wall hop. And uh, they're also giving you a punch. So um, you can, those, those are the only buttons that you have, I think. Yeah. Like you can you know, jump off walls and, and do a that, punch. That was part of the attraction. It was, it was a rather simplistic kind of game mechanic, um, you know, kind of simplistic environment. But it, it is extremely challenging, surprisingly challenging. I, I haven't mm. played the game myself. but Yeah, one of the things it did really well was it had superb level design. So you yeah. could play it at different levels. Like there was, you know, it was all the same level, but you could play it at uh, a beginner, uh, intermediate, and expert kind of speed running uh, level so um, you know just by taking different shortcuts and attempting different maneuvers uh, you could try to get the the fastest time so this uh, this endless runner version of it the super meat boy forever is going to have that same sort of level design yeah. so just with those two buttons uh, you will absolutely have uh, shorter and harder paths that you can go down and I think I also saw them mention something about uh, levels that are not the same every day, uh, right. randomly generated okay. levels. So um, That's interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm super duper keen for that yeah. one. And what else got your attention? Uh, Tiny Metal is another one on the uh, the Nindies list. So um, because, uh, because the Advance Wars sequel that I've been wanting for ages and ages is just not uh, not coming, I guess. They, they yeah. keep on making Fire Emblem games. Um, so it's you know, more power to you, but I really want an Advance Wars. It's not coming. So Tiny Metal is kind of like filling that space. Um, I think that's been a hole in the market for years. Like there have yeah. been some people that attempted it, but there's nothing of the same quality uh, as Advance Wars. There was a mobile game that came out a little while ago for free, um, which actually pretty good, yeah. um, but it only had a really basic rock, paper, scissors structure for combat. Um, so uh, yeah, Tiny Metal, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a super addictive format. I don't know why more people, Careful. like just, it's, you can make the game and you can sell it to a whole bunch of people out there who are just jonesing for an Advance Wars. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And uh, just quickly, any others, it, it, the two big ones? Yeah, it looks like um, we had uh, Doom and the new Wolfenstein are going to be coming to the uh, Switch as well. Uh, I think that's going to be in 2018. So, um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, um, that'll be exciting. Yeah, it looks like a, a, a juxtaposition to me whenever I see a game like Doom on a Nintendo console. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah no, exactly. Family-friendly. Sorry, I was distracted in the background. We had a... <laughs> Mario's nipples uh, some, showed up on the screen, nips. so grab my I attention. don't blame you. Yeah, I they're, know. They're, they're, they're pretty hot. They follow your eyes around the room. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's terrible. Um, but yeah, so there you go. Um, it's Super Nintendo. It's super Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> it is a Super it, it, Nintendo. It is very super. Um, so check out all the, the info um, that's been coming out on that. So there's uh, been a bit of news in the, in the eSports um, news. Wow, look at that. News in the news. Um, a local platform um, called Gamers, G 
G A M U R S. Yeah. Uh, founded by a local Sydney cider. Um, it's recently been announced that they have managed to get a whole heap of money from a, a big investment firm um, and to kind of grow their esports coverage uh, around the world, specifically in Asia. Um, so we thought it was quite an interesting uh, development that, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity in the esports space um, in a variety of different ways. Um, so Gamers is was originally founded as a kind of Facebook specifically for esports. So it was designed to be a social platform, um, you know, to primarily focused on esports and competitive gamers. And um, yeah, it, it's had a lot of success. Um, you know, the guy's done a really good job of kind of growing it. Um, the audience um, is predicted to be four and a half million um, monthly active users uh, by the end of this year. So yeah, it's an excellent result. And it's always great to hear successful local stories. Um, but it, it, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because it's, you know, a, we've seen the development of leagues, we've seen kind of new sites popping up. This is kind of something a bit different where it's where it's an actual, it's a social channel. Yeah, I'm a little, I guess I'm a little embarrassed even that I had no idea that this existed and this this was happening in Sydney for, what, four years now? Yeah. And they've managed to raise $3.5 million and uh, I'd never heard of them. I had heard of Dot Esports, which yeah. is... Uh, a, a news, an esports news site that they had bought, yeah. and uh, it turns out it's not the only one they've bought. They've bought several others as well yeah, over the years. Yeah, they're pretty active. Um, so uh, you know, well done to them. Uh, Dot Esports seems like a, a pretty cool site. Yeah. Uh, had no idea there was a, a social network behind yeah. it, and uh, or well, even and how social, that works. And the social network is buying the content provider. Like it's you mm. know it's following the kind of paths of a lot of uh, you know the bigger players. But yeah, it was it was really interesting. And like you say, like really active even before this investment. So mm. um, you know it'll be interesting to see kind of where this money's placed and how, what they do with it. They they did say in the announcement that Asia was their focus, and that's why they partnered with this specific fund because of their experience in that region, which makes sense, you know. Mm. Um, it is also a very saturated market for esports platforms. And um, we were talking about it off camera before, um, your platform of choice it, for social for social networks in gaming is Discord, right? Yeah, so. I mean, uh, that's that's kind of what I was wondering. When I hear, you know, social network for gamers or something like that, yeah. I, my mind naturally goes to, well, what can you do there that you can't do on Discord and the other platforms as yeah. well? Um, I was looking around for a feature list. I actually couldn't find one. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Apparently, they've got like thirty staff spread between Austin and Sydney. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that their uh, player population, uh, their users, are are spread in the in a similar way. Yeah. I mean, um, we're both from publishing backgrounds, so we we know that you know, obviously audiences usually skew towards the US. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see a breakdown of kind of where those eyeballs are and where those people are. Um, but you know it's it's great. Like like I said at the start, it's really great to see local companies doing good things in this space. Um, but and, you know you've been part of the esports scene for a really long time, long before it was trendy and sexy. And you know, awesome shows like that gaming show were coming up and covering it. Um, you were covering it long before then. Yeah. Um, so you've been been across the scene for a really long time. Um, you know and. We, and again, we've said on previous versions of the show and, and off camera before that you know it, it's very much a land grab at the moment. Everyone's just trying oh, yeah. to to get in there and grab everything they can and you know and work it out and you know get a bit the biggest slice of the pie they can. It's all happening. It's right all now. happening. So you know this is obviously one angle that that's in the esports space. What out of the you know the Overwatch League and the you know um, Gfinity, which announced um, what they're doing locally with their team based uh, city based teams. Mm -hmm. um, it, end of next year, I believe. You know, where do you think it's? Who's going to be the su successor out of this this massive land grab? Who's, who's going to win? Who's going to win? <laughs> that is uh, an an interesting question because I see, I don't know who's going to win. I see interesting sort of pitfalls that uh, people could run into. Uh, you know, the the city based thing. Uh, I don't think it's bad, but it is funny to me how you know we we have a medium based on broadband and then we decide to tie it to geography to again. It, yeah. um, but uh, I also see, you know, big sporting franchises, mainstream uh, real life sporting franchises buying up esports team, uh, esports teams like it's some kind of real estate rush. Yeah. Um, but they're so, buying up teams that have uh, short term contracts with players. Yeah. And this is a space where players are used to very abandoning fluid. ship as yeah. soon as something goes wrong. They can very easily just go and make a team amongst themselves yeah. elsewhere. So, so you what's think it's protecting, a bit of a flawed strategy? 
then the, um, these I think it's dangerous. These traditional teams, uh, yeah. sporting franchises buying. I think so. I think it's dangerous to to buy a team, and even if even if there's a contract with the players for one year, maybe even two years, because there's there's no guarantees. Yeah. Like these are young people, um, and they can very easily just go somewhere else and compete. Like yeah. they, you know, there's there's not much stopping them. You might have given them the house and, and stuff like that, but they've got these skills. Uh, there's yeah. not much tying them there. So I think it's very possible for us to see uh, a situation soon where a, uh, a big franchise buys a team and then you know something goes wrong and, and five players just leave and yeah. start a new esports franchise. Because um, Adelaide Crows are one of the teams, Australian sporting teams, which has bought a local esports franchise, uh, esports team. On the, so on the flip side of, of what you're saying, um, would the expertise that these franchises have and you know the AFLs and NRLs of the world Dealing with player contract, would they be perfectly positioned to come in and provide a bit of structure to mm. the esports environment? Because they're used to dealing with player contracts and you know having people sign for X time for the right terms and all these kind of things. Yeah, and that could be a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some headlines recently for uh, you know Overwatch players. Uh, I think there was a 17-year-old Overwatch player who recently signed a contract which was very very large. I, I'm forgetting the exact figure, um, but but he's pretty much set for the next few years. Yeah. Um, and so now that we're seeing that, it's, uh, you know, hopefully they will bring a level of professionalism to them to protect themselves and yep. also to protect the players. Yeah. Uh, but they're all quite think, young. Like, yeah, they're quite young. It's the, the potential to be exploited is there. Yeah. I think it's important that the players are protected, um, you know, whether that's through some kind of industry body that, yeah. that uh, helps organize legal advice or, you know, I don't know how that's going to happen. Yeah. But um, I have done some work previously with um, an esports players association that's trying to set itself up here. But as with everything, everyone's trying to work it out. Like everyone's starting these things and trying to like you know be the one left standing at the end. So yeah. um, there are a lot of you know Australian esports organizations. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, all you need is you know, <laughs> register your, your ABN, and uh, you too can be a player manager in the esports space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it's interesting because I was talking to um, another person in the industry who w was laughing at the idea of the city-based teams yeah and was like that is so ridiculous it's gonna fail but and i but, find it funny too i don't think it'll fail but i, I find yeah. it funny but and we've said it on the show and, and i actually think that it's a great idea a great way to get people that aren't really invested in esports to pay attention like yeah you know jackson and i talk, were talking about it i'm a massive new england patriots fan mm -hmm. and robert Kraft, the owner of the patriots owns the boston team in the overwatch league i will definitely watch that team play Mm -hmm. um, you know, I might not tune in forever, but I'll definitely tune in for the first match. Mm -hmm. You know, I get that. You know, I think it's it's been a long time since uh, the actual geography meant anything in yeah. the top level of normal sports, anyway, right? Yeah. Like, you know, the I guess Barcelona is kind of a rare case where FC Barcelona had seven out of their starting eleven actually come up through the Barcelona youth system. That's yeah. that's a rare tale in uh, modern football, but you know. It, and I guess countries do have some laws around, you know, like a certain amount of players must be from the country. But um, people are, you know, people don't have a loyalty to their city when it comes to accepting contracts and, and playing their game. Yeah, they'll move all around, and then we have this, which is, you know, yeah. we'll have uh, in online competitions. You'll have a team of five where someone's based in Melbourne and someone in Brisbane, and yeah, that's that's how it works. So um, it's just kind of funny. Um, but, you know, yeah, maybe it will inspire some kind of fan loyalty, even if the players don't have loyalty. Maybe the fans will. Yeah. Uh, maybe they'll turn out and wear Sydney sky blue, just like, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I can wear my Patriots jerseys to go watch. Well, it's funny that they go with the city-based teams and then all games are played in L.A. for the, the yeah. Overwatch League. So it's like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. That said, I mean, you know, anything that allows Australia to succeed, the whole, you know, Team Australia doing well in yeah. Overwatch. Uh, yeah. Hey, I felt a bit of pride, like. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no, I, you know, I heard the news because I, I didn't tune in. I you know, heard the news, you know, as it was announced, and was like, bloody hell! Like, I've got to pay attention now. We're good this at something. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, typical bandwagon jumper. But um, we we did have a question come in um, from Wilhelm um, saying, uh, did he scream it? He did scream it. Um, the amount of money that's being invested in gamers, mm. you know, three point five million, like. Is that actually enough to make a dent in Asia, where you've got long-established yeah. you know, players, especially in South Korea and you know in China? 
Is that going to be enough to actually make the impact they want? Good question. I mean, uh, you've got localization of, of, of the web app to think about and, and all that sort of thing. So um, I guess it's enough to have a bit of staff there and, and start. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly not enough to, to take on the big players all by itself, but they've already got some software there. I think it's... Uh, I, you know, without knowing much about the yeah. software, I haven't used it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, localizing it to the region and um, hoping that they can offer something that the other platforms can't. I think there's probably some like I don't. China uses different social networks to us. But well, and this is the, this is what I was thinking is that it's you know they don't even use. You could create the Facebook of you know, esports, and if you put that in China, they don't even use Facebook. So it's like all right, maybe they'll like, fly under the radar. You know, they won't yeah. be censored or banned yeah you know? <laughs> maybe maybe that's that's the way around the wall so uh, but look you know it's a great local success story and it's something that, that we'll be following and something that we definitely endorse and we think it's great that uh, they've managed to to kick a pretty massive goal um mm. with launching the platform and, yeah, well and done. achieving the success they've got so mate keep up the good work um yeah we wish you all the best in asia and we look forward to following your success um so that's all we have time for this week. Um, I'd like to thank Junglist for joining us this week and uh, allowing us to to have a good old yarn about what's going on in the world of uh, gaming and esports. So, um, yeah, we'll be back here next Thursday at 8 p.m. Um, who knows we'll be on the panel next week. Um, but, yeah, it'd be great to see you then. See you later. <laughs>